Well, good morning. This first song says, of course, victory in Jesus. And there really is no true victory in our lives without Jesus. So it's just a wonderful, wonderful hymn. So let's stand together as we sing victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood Cause the blind to see, and then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Sing it out this morning, Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. Sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. I I heard about a mansion he has built for me in the glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angel singing and the old redemption story, and the sun. I'll sing up there a song of victory. Sing it out. Here we go. Oh, victory in the Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his Good morning and welcome this morning. It's good to see you all here. Um, it's good to see some of the choir members sitting in the pew. Not that we don't love having you up here because we do, but I know it's great to have the day off and to just worship. Um, it's a little weird sometimes. I was telling Mike before the service, Shannon and I have not ridden to a Sunday morning worship and since I, we were dating, I believe. Um, so how neat to be able to ride together. Uh, choir members and spouses. 
It's a beautiful day. And the beauty of God's love and grace is in our lives. This is something worth celebrating. Let's worship our risen Lord. Preparing for the next number, and I thought, well, they're doing it now, or they okay. Thank you, guys. That was awesome. Awesome. If you have your Bible, turn to Galatians. You can look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 1, uh, excuse me, 14 through 17. We are in the middle of a sermon series, What Happened at the Cross. We are actually following Billy Graham's book um, with the same title, What Happened at the Cross for this sermon series. Um, Today's subject is victory. Galatians 6, starting with verse 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. 
And of course, what he means there is things that were in the world that used to be important to him now no longer matter. They've been crucified to him because of the cross. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. To the Israel of God, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Victory. Very seldom would we ever consider someone's execution a victory. However, in Jesus' case, it is exactly that. Because it means the death of death itself. It means that sin no longer has a sting. Today we're going to cover seven statements that Jesus made from the cross. But before we do that, I want to give you a very brief over, overview of exactly what Jesus was suffering when he made those statements. Crucifixion was invented not by the Romans, but by the Persians in 300 B.C. It was developed or perfected by the Romans into a punishment that is the most reserved for the most serious criminals who were not Roman citizens. Roman citizens who were executed were beheaded because it was quick and there wasn't a tremendous amount of suffering. People who weren't Roman citizens were allowed to suffer. In fact, the purpose was to make you suffer as long as possible. Because crucifixion wasn't invented until 300 B.C., to me that makes it all the more amazing that Isaiah wrote in 700 B.C. an exact description of the Messiah's crucifixion. Because when he wrote the description of the crucifixion, crucifixion had not been invented yet. Nor was there a Messiah yet. So he described a punishment that had not been created to a man who had not yet been born and did it in exact detail. If there's no other proof that Jesus is the Messiah, that, for me, is enough. One of the ways that the Romans perfected crucifixion is with scourging. Before you went to the cross, you were scourged. If you could pull up our picture for us. This is a drawing of a scourge. Um, it's not just a whip. People say Jesus was whipped. Well, I, I would not even call it whipping. It's more of a beating. And scourge had within it lead pieces for weight, jagged pieces for cutting. And they would beat you, stand on one side, and beat the other side of your back until there was nothing left to beat, and then go stand on the other side and beat the opposite side. The scourge itself is actually called several different things. One of the names that are, well, actually they're different types, but one of them is a cat of nine tails. Nine tails because that particular one had nine tassels. But the reason they call it a cat is because the metal, the shards of metal, were actually intended to stick in the flesh like a cat's paw. I don't know if you've ever wrestled with a cat. Um, they don't turn loose easily. So the purpose was to stick this metal in the flesh, and then once it's stuck there, twist it and drag it. That's what happened to Jesus first. Some people die from being scourged. 
He then was given the top part of the cross to carry. You can take that down. To Golgotha. Where nails are put through his wrists. And he's hung on a cross. We used to think that it was, there were three nails. One in each wrist and one through both feet. Which is still possible. But we now have archaeological evidence that they also did it with four nails, one through each wrist, and one through each ankle bone, so that your feet were on the side of the cross. With a slight bend in your knees, so that when the muscles around your lungs start to give away and your esophagus gets cut off, you could actually push up just a little bit and get air. You see, death by crucifixion comes from suffocation, usually, not blood loss. So Jesus, hanging there, after having been beaten, after having been crucified, suffering in the heat, That's the conditions under which he makes these seven statements. The first one relates to forgiveness. Luke 23, verse, uh, verse 24, we hear him say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Imagine the punishment that we're talking about. And as he's hanging there, he looks out and says, Lord, forgive them for what they're doing. I have trouble forgiving someone who cuts me off in traffic. What kind of amazing grace does it take when you're hanging on the cross to ask your father to forgive those who put you there? But he wasn't just talking about the people in that crowd at that moment. He's also speaking of us. Because what held him on the cross was, in fact, our sin. So, when he looks out and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, it's our sin for which he was crucified. So he's also speaking to us. He's not just talking to the Roman soldiers who are casting lots to see who gets his tunic. But he was speaking of us. So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, when he says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Clearly those were not just words. Clearly, that is exactly what he meant for us to do. The second thing he said had to do with salvation. Luke 23, verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Are you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since... You are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing. Then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Salvation. I'd like to point out that the thief on the cross that had a promise from Jesus to be with him in paradise that day was baptized neither by submersion nor sprinkling. But only by the grace of Jesus Christ. Do we baptize? Absolutely, because Jesus said to. But baptizing is not where it's at. It is by the grace of Jesus Christ and Christ alone. I 
I'd also like to point out, of the two criminals, one ridiculed Jesus, but also said, save yourself and us. So the one who wasn't saved is actually the one who said, save us. The other one, humbly acknowledging his own sin and his own failure and the fact that he deserved to be there, he didn't even ask to be forgiven. He said, remember me. That humility and that willingness to confess our sin to Christ is what made the difference. It is about our heart. The third thing he said from the cross had to do with comfort. John 19, verses 26 26 and 27. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing there. It's in the Gospel of John, so the disciple that he loved was John. So he's trying to be humble, but it's not working. Um, And he said to her, woman... Here is your son, not meaning him, but John. And to the disciple, he said, here is your mother. From that time on, John took Mary into his home and took care of her. Jesus was the firstborn son. Joseph was deceased. Jesus was responsible for the family house and everyone in it. A woman couldn't own property. Now, did he have younger brothers? He did. But he may not have trusted them. (laughs) So he asked John to take care of his mother. All while suffering untold misery on the cross... He's thinking about the people out there. He's thinking about the people in Malden. He's thinking about who's going to take care of his mother. All while struggling to breathe. The fourth thing he said had to do with reconciliation. <clears throat> John chapter 12, verses 27 28. Not, he, this is not from the cross. He said, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. His purpose was to reunite us in relationship with God the Father. And our sin came between us. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, Without shedding blood there is no forgiveness. But Jesus became sin. So that it might be destroyed. Jesus says from the cross, Father, why have you forsaken me? And the reason his father had forsaken him is because God can't look upon sin. And all the sin in all the world is placed upon Jesus. And his father turns his head the other way. The fifth point that Billy Graham makes from statements Jesus made from the, from the cross, he says he's the thirst quencher. And I'm going to tell you that this one's a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> Jesus says from the cross, I thirst, and they take a sponge with vinegar on it and hoist it up to him. It does cause us to flash back to John 4, verse 6. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon, and a woman from Samaria came by herself because she was a woman with a horrible reputation. 
She'd been with five or six different husbands, and the man she was living with at that time was not her husband. Jesus said, I'm thirsty. Can you give me some water? She said, you're, you're a man from Jerusalem. Why would, why would you ask me for water? They weren't even supposed to speak to each other. Well, if you knew who it was that was asking you for water, you could ask him for living water. She's like, are you some kind of prophet or something? Because that's a weird thing to say otherwise. And then he told her all about her life. And she ran into Samaria, even with her terrible reputation, people listened to her because she was so excited. I met a man. And people were like, you've met a lot of men. <laughs> she said, no, I met a man who knew everything about me from my birth all the way through to now. He's the Messiah. And all of Samaria came out and received grace. Grace. Because of her. Clearly, Jesus does thirst for people's souls. I don't know if he ever got water or not. He's the furniture and the finisher of our faith. John 19, verse 30, he says, It is finished. I remember as a child watching a movie about Jesus and, and that dramatic moment when he's hanging on the cross. And in this particular movie, he says, it is finished, and he hung his head over. And I always thought it was talking about the crucifixion is finished. That's not what he meant. He meant the work of salvation is finished. It is done the thing that he came to earth to do, the 33 years that he spent here, completed, done, it's finished. Because right after that, we're told that the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest, the, the curtain that had the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat where God resided, torn in half, that curtain that symbolized the separation that exists between God and humanity, that curtain that represented our sin that separated us from him, torn in half because the work is finished. seventh thing he said Luke 23 verse 46 Father into your hands I commit my spirit when he said this he breathed his last when I think about what Jesus has done for us I'm left with one thought. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, in in the life of your son, Jesus, we see love and grace. In his death, we see how much you detest our sin. May we not flippantly go about our lives continuing to sin. But nor allow us to try to be good to please you. Lord, may we be humble May we be able to confess to you our shortcomings and receive your grace. And having received your grace, live lives that bring glory to you. 
And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's kind of hard to, uh, to say something after a message like that, what Jesus did for us. Let's sing the beautiful hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus Shall We Stand. Let us join together as God's church, using the Apostles' Creed, affirm what we do believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we continue in worship as the ushers receive the morning offering. Father, we thank you that through worship today we can give. Giving is worship, and worship is giving. So accept your tithes and our offerings in your name. Amen.
As we go into our prayer time, as uh, we started last week, sort of doing something a little bit different in our prayer time. And that's to give you the opportunity to pray, uh, rather than us just standing here and praying on your behalf. So here's what we're asking you to do. If you're able, and if you so desire, is to look through the list and choose one or two names, come to the altar, kneel and pray for them. Uh, maybe you have other things. Uh, maybe there's some things on your heart that you would like to pray for. Or maybe it's uh, pray for our nation, pray, pray for anything. But this is uh, sort of trying to get us more engaged in our prayer time rather than it be just listening to someone pray. Uh, to update the list, uh, it's, it is fairly current except for one. Uh, if you'll look on our long-term uh, concerns, you see Latori Jimson. We've been praying for Latori for uh, a good while now. Her latest scan shows that her cancer has spread, and they're looking uh, at some new treatments that they may start in the next couple of weeks. And so please make Latori a special concern uh, as you go to your prayer time. This is your time. This is God's time. You can come to the altar, as we said. You can pray in your seat, whatever God leads you to do. Let's pray together. Father, what a beautiful thing to see the people of God in prayer, to feel your presence like a mighty wind blow through this place. God, hear our prayers and give us an answer. Thank you for the victory 
that Christ brings to us through the cross. And it is in his name that we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everybody. If I have kids, y'all can come on down. I'm going to come sit over here with you guys. I'll just squeeze in right here. What on earth? Again? Got a few more coming. You can sit right there, buddy. You can sit right there. Can you see right there? Zoe, can you see? All right. All right. So last week, we like went all the way to the very beginning of the Bible. Now, I'm not going to go nearly that far back today, but pretty, pretty close. Now, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, they were celebrating something called Passover. Now, what on earth is the Passover? I'm going to talk about that today. All right, so um, Israel was in slavery in a place called Egypt. Do you know what story I'm getting ready to tell? Can you take a guess? That's okay. If you don't know, I'm going to tell it. All right, so this guy named Moses, God heard the cry of his people, right? And so he picked Moses. And how did, how did God talk to Moses? A burning bush, right? And he said, Moses, you're going to go to Pharaoh, and you're going to say, let my people go. And Moses kind of argued with them. There's a long like, little argument that happened. But finally, Moses said yes. And so Moses and his brother, Aaron, went to Egypt to talk to Pharaoh. She sure is. Do you want to come sit over here? <laughs> come on, bud. You can sit right there. All right, so Moses goes to Egypt. Do you think Pharaoh says, yeah, I'll let, you, I'll let your people go. Yeah, I'll get rid of my free labor. Yeah, y'all can just walk on out of here. Do you think that's what Pharaoh said? Nope. He said, no way. Who is this God? I don't have to listen to him. So God sends 10 plagues. All right, let's see if we can guess what these are. We're going to go through them pretty quick. What is this one? Can you guess? Yes, when he turned the Nile into blood. All right, so that was number one. Did Pharaoh say, yep, y'all can go? Nope. So here's number two. What is number two? Frogs. I hate frogs. All right, so did Pharaoh say, yeah, y'all can go? Nope, he said no. All right, what is this one? Gnats. Gnats. Gnats everywhere, just all over the place. It's like mosquitoes, right? It's just everywhere. They're annoying. Did Pharaoh say, yep, y'all can go? Nope. All right, so here's number four. Then he sent some flies. All right, did Pharaoh let his people go? Nope. All right, what do you think this one is? It looks like going to bed, but they were really, really sick, right? And so all they could do is lay in bed. So they got really, really sick. Everybody in Egypt got really, really sick, and they didn't know why. Did Pharaoh say, yes, they could go? Nope. So here comes plague number six. Who can guess what this one is? This one's pretty nasty. Boils. Oh, boils all over their skin, all in Egypt. But did Pharaoh let the people go? Nope. So here comes plague number seven. What is this one? Lightning, Lightning and hail, right? All over Egypt. It destroyed their crops, everything. Did Pharaoh let his people go? No. Nope. All right. Number eight. What is this one? Locusts nasty. Again, messed up all of their crops. They were everywhere. They were in their bed. They were all over the place. Did Pharaoh say, yep, y'all can go? Nope. He was stubborn. He was very stubborn. So God, God kept on showing him, I am God. I am God. What is this next one? Can you guess? Darkness. Have you ever been in a cave? 
Okay, so when you're in a cave and they turn off all the lights, there is zero light coming from anywhere. And when you're standing there, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. So that's how dark it was in all of Egypt. But did Pharaoh let his people go? Nope. All right, so number 10 was the harshest and the worst one of all. And this is where we get the term Passover. So God, in his final show of how mighty and amazing he was, decided to send the angel of death. Now he said, all you have to do is just put blood on the doorpost. And if you put blood on the doorpost, the angel will fly and pass over you. So do you think the Egyptians and Pharaoh did that? Nope, because they didn't believe in this God, right? But do you think all of Israel did? So all of Israel put the blood on the doorpost. And what do you think happened when the angel came and he saw this blood? He passed over them. So where do you think we get the term pass over? From the angel passing over. So God had this plan, right? We talked last week about how when Adam and Eve sinned, God had this great rescue plan, and this was a part of it. Now, God rescued Israel from Egypt, but did you know that God rescued us, rescued all of us? Can you guess how God rescued us? It's the reason we celebrate Easter. It's a Sunday school answer, guys. Jesus. Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, God sent Jesus to die for us, right? And so now we are rescued. We are saved from our sins. We don't have to make sacrifices because sacrifices just won't cover all of our sins. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice, and he rescued us just like the blood on this doorpost. And so finally, did Pharaoh let the people go? Yeah, he finally let the people go. Now, he changed his mind, and there's this whole, there's this whole thing. But I could sit here, and we could talk about the whole rest of the Bible, and I know you don't want to do that right now. Maybe later. All right, so I want to thank God just right now for just saving us, right? We celebrate, Jews celebrate the Passover still because they don't believe that Jesus came and died for our sins. So we're just going to pray right now and just thank God for the amazing gift that he gave us. So let's pray together. Dear God, we just thank you so much that you loved us so much that you sent your son. God, we don't deserve it. God, we are sinful. We always break your rules, but God, you loved us, and you sent Jesus to die for our sins, and he is the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. And so now you just pass right over us. You don't look at our sins, God, because we are covered with the blood of Jesus. God, we love you, and it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. All right, I got treats for you guys. I'll give these to you during Sunday school, okay? But you guys, make sure you ask your grown-ups before you eat them. Thank you, Maddie. Good morning. Just have a few announcements that we want to mention to you all today. Uh, we want to remind you all that our next Wednesday evening meal is coming up on April the 6th. So that's not this Wednesday, but the following one. Uh, please register ahead of time by Monday, April 4th, so we can get that ready for you all. Also, this week we had 76 people report 1,970 miles to our walk to Jerusalem which leaves 1,371 miles to go. So we can reach Jerusalem this week and we can start making our way back to Malden by Easter. So keep up the great work, uh, keep on walking and praying as we go. And lastly, we just wanna mention the youth and children were able to raise $2,970 for water mission. Uh, we also had a great time at our walk for water yesterday. It was a beautiful day and we were able to go out and, and celebrate that together. And the children actually beat out the youth in our little competition, so congrats to them, and uh, just thank you all for your support. And now I believe we have another handbell special for you all. John, you were supposed to wear shorts today to show off extra days and legs, right? Bro. Just a minute with a beautiful song called Rock of My Soul.
Shall we stand together as we sing our last hymn this morning? Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's really sing it out. Probably no true words. Hallelujah. What a Savior. There's victory in the cross. There is victory there. So take that news into the world that needs to hear it. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> 